the World Report, your compass to African news and the world beyond. I'm Fatihia Mohamed Noor. In the headlines, Mali political parties request elections after Yunse shuns a transition promise. Severe drought and famine in southern Africa leaves almost 20 million people facing hunger. Somalia parliament passes bail allowing president to appoint the prime minister. Israeli airstrike destroys Iranian consulate in Syria. And in Mexico, eight Chinese migrants found dead on the beach. Welcome to the program. Now, political parties in Mali have requested for a time frame for presidential elections after the junta military failed to fulfill its promise of 24-month transition back to democracy. Political parties in Mali have requested a time frame for presidential elections after the ruling junta failed to organize polls within the promised 24-month transition back to democracy. Mali has been under military rule since August 2020, the first of eight coups in West and Central Africa over four years, including its neighbors Burkina Faso and Niger. Regional blocs have been trying to negotiate transitions, but the interim governments have been slow in the transition. Mali's current junta says power in a second 2021 coup and later promised to take 24 months from March 2022 to restore civilian rule with a start date of March 26, 2024 and elections in February. In a joint statement late on Sunday, some of Mali's main political parties and civil society groups call on authorities to set up an institutional framework for polls as soon as possible. At least 2.7 million people have been affected by hunger in Zimbabwe after drought has affected large parts of the southern African region. It has scorched the crops that tens of millions of people grow themselves and rely on to survive, helped by what should be the rainy season. A year ago, much of this region was drenched by deadly tropical storms and floods. Somalia has now made significant changes to its constitution, granting the president the opportunity to appoint and dismiss the prime minister. This decision, approved by a substantial majority of parliament, follows intense debates within the Federal Assembly in Mogadishu. An Israeli airstrike has reportedly destroyed the Iranian consulate in Syria's capital Damascus, killing and wounding several people. According to Iranian state media, a senior revolutionary guards commander Brigadier General Mohammad Reza Zahedi and several diplomats were among the dead. Pictures showed smoke and dust rising from the multi-story building which was next to the Iranian embassy on a highway in the western Meza district. The Israeli military said it did not comment on foreign media reports. Syrian air defenses shot down some of the missiles they launched, but other missiles made it through and destroyed the entire building, killing and injuring everyone inside, the ministry added. The ministry said work was underway to recover bodies and rescue the wounded from underneath the rubble without giving any information about their identities. Bodies of eight Chinese nationals have been found in Mexico after their boat capsized. The bodies of eight Chinese nationals have been found on a beach in the Mexican state of Osaka after their boat capsized. The bodies were found along a route used by illegal migrants trying to reach the United States. The seven women and a man were on board a boat operated by a Mexican that set off from Chiapas state on the border with Guatemala. One other person survived. It is said it was investigating the cause of the accident and working with the Chinese embassy in Mexico to identify the victims. More than 6.3 million migrants have entered the U.S. illegally since 2021. On the big story this week, we focus on Somalia's new amendment of the constitution that is now allowing the president to appoint and dismiss the prime minister. <laughs> This decision was made after a lot of deliberation by the Independent Constitutional Review and Implementation Commission ICRIC. The power struggle between the president and the MP has been witnessed in Somali politics for years due to constitutional ambiguities. The Speaker of the Lower House, Sheikh Adam Mohamed Noor Madobe, announced a significant majority of members were in favor of amending the constitution. A total of 212 members of the Lower House 
House and 42 members of the Upper House supported the amendment with no abstentions or rejection. The requirement needed for parliamentary confidence vote with a president appointment prime minister is a five-year term of government bodies and advocating for multi-party system. However, Opposition from some political figure persists due to concern of insufficient concerns. <laughs> Tasmima Ibrahim, KTN News. On election pass this week, we focus on the East African nation of Rwanda. Rwanda's President Paul Kagame is running for another term and has been endorsed as candidate by two of the oldest political parties. The Liberal Party and the Social Democratic Party endorsed the Rwanda Patriotic Front candidate Paul Kagame in the July presidential race. This is joining four smaller political parties which are already in coalition with the ruling RPF in endorsing Kagame. Kagame has ruled over Rwanda for decades. He won the presidency in elections in 2003, 2010 and 2017 with more than 90% of the votes. Critics and rights groups accuse him of ruling in a climate of fear that stifles dissent and free speech. Rwanda will hold presidential and parliamentary polls on July 15th. A presidential order in the official Gazette said voting for president and 53 deputies in the lower house of parliament would happen across the country on July 15th and the remaining 27 deputies would be elected on July 16th. Kagame has been president since 2000, but effectively in control since his rebel force marched into Kigali in 1994 to end the genocide. He is eligible to continue in office for another decade after a constitutional amendment in 2015 changed term limits. Kagame's only challenger in the July polls is opposition Green Party leader Frank Habineza. The 47-year-old member of parliament secured only 0.45% of the ballot in the 2017 election, coming third in the polls that rights groups are criticized for irregularities and voter intimidation. The other potential challenger to Kagame, Victoire Ingabire, leader of the unregistered Delpha Omurunzi, that is the Development and Liberty for All movement, is blocked from the presidential race due to a past conviction. 24 women MPs, two youth representatives, and a representative for disabled Rwandans will be chosen by electoral colleges and committees on July 16. Candidates will be allowed to campaign from June 22 until July 12, according to the election calendar. On the interview segment this week, I sit down with the EU ambassador to Kenya to find out what is the role of EU in the country. Thank you so much for making time for us on World Report. Um, uh, just for the audience to understand, what are the key priorities between the European Union and Kenya currently? The EU has had a very long-standing relationship with Kenya for many, many years. And when we started, we were more, more focusing on development cooperation. So projects, programs, and over the years, we have developed a very strong uh, relationship which is comprehensive, so developing very much the political cooperation between the EU and Kenya, our trade and investment links. So now we have a very uh, strategic relationship with Kenya, which is going from strength to strength. So last December we just signed a trade agreement, EU-Kenya trade agreement for free access uh, to our respective markets. That is a big milestone um, and uh, maybe a trendsetter also in Africa. And um, we had um, started a strategic dialogue between EU and Kenya. So uh, Kenya in many ways has now a privileged relationship with the EU and we have so many member states here, 19, um, and they all have VIPs coming. So we had so many ministers, presidents, prime ministers coming. The president was, um, President Ruto was in, um, in Brussels last year and he was in Strasbourg visiting um, the European Parliament. The president of the European Commission, which is the highest authority in the EU, was twice in Kenya last year. 
what does that say? Yeah? So um, I think we have never had better and more comprehensive uh, ties. Are there specific initiatives, development initiatives that you're supporting in Kenya at the moment? Um, we're supporting many, especially in greening and digitization, but we are also increasingly supporting Kenya as a regional and, and um, global security actor. So um, the EU is very interested in strengthening Kenya's role to help bring peace into the region. So we very much appreciated uh, what Kenya did to help Ethiopia, uh, to try to help Sudan, South Sudan, DRC, the Nairobi process. And also you have seen that <clears throat> Kenya had a very successful role in the Security Council. And so the EU very much appreciated that and supported Kenya. And now Kenya wants to help Haiti getting back on its feet. So the importance of Kenya as a political and security actor in the world is very important for us and we very much support that. But also on global governance, for example, on climate change, the EU very much supported the role that the president of this republic has taken on climate change. And in recognition of that, we are now negotiating a green partnership with Kenya to help Kenya in that space also nationally in its territory, but also in its role to help shape global responses. Also, for example, on the reform of the multilateral development banks to bring green financing in and to the world. So we are uh, establishing a group of friends with Kenya on this. But uh, more to what we do in Kenya concretely, um, uh, we are very much uh, in the space of gender equality as well, because we are convinced that gender equality is strengthening democracy. If there are disadvantaged parts of the population, population cannot develop. So this is true for specific social groups, but also for geographic locations. So uh, to reduce inequalities is key for any country to move to upper middle income status. So that's, that is why we are so firmly believing in gender equality. And one of the key issues that hampered gender equality in Kenya is female genital mutilation. So for International Women's Day this year, we decided to go to El Geo Marquet, where you had a, a very strong cutting season last December. And um, the, there was a tra tragic incident of the the killing of a policeman who tried to protect girls from being cut. He was killed and um, when I was there now for International Women's Day, I met also two priests who were injured in that process, who tried to shield the girls and protect the girls and the mob was just uh, overrunning them. So um, we talked with the governor and the authorities in El Geo Marquet. And we, um, we are very, um, we are very uh, persuaded that uh, there are many forces in the county that want to help to protect the girls. Because um, now we have the new school holidays, the Easter holidays. This is the new cutting season. And what happens is that thousands of girls will never return to school. Once they're cut, they're being married off in most cases. And, um, and that takes them, that ends their career, let's say. Um, so we want that girls have choices. So our campaign for International Women's Day was education, not 
mutilation. And we have seen globally that education is the best tool for women empowerment. So if you can keep girls in school, they can fend for themselves. They do realize what is good for them. They can make their own decisions. They can get their own money. So they have economic and social independence that will help them also to be better contributors to the society. So <clears throat> we partnered in El Geo Marquette with Brighter Society Initiative uh, by Saddam Hussein. She is an FGM survivor, Muslim FGM survivor. And um, she made it her life goal to help other girls not to suffer what she has gone through. And uh, we are now starting a new project to help FGM frontline activists because we are convinced that people do the cut because they want to do good. They don't want to harm the girl. They think that this is what opens life to them as a rites of passage, that they can get married, they are recognized as proper women. So to overcome that sort of culture that maybe, um, maybe has, is based on overcome beliefs and traditions and false beliefs, we are also working with men. And you know, when you see men, because we also did films on FGM, where you're being explained what is actually happening and what this is doing to girls. The guys don't know that a girl is tied with the legs and has to stay there for four weeks to heal, that many have lifelong hurt they have many complications when they give birth and so on. When the guys and elders and religious leaders, when they see those movies, many are crying. They're saying, we had no idea. We had no idea this is, this is what it is. We thought it was something good. So um, we're working in this space not because only of FGM. We are convinced that this helps all the community. It helps women and in extension it helps the families and the men as well. And it helps the country. So the, the rates have gone down, thank God, in Kenya. But it's illegal. But it's still widely practiced and there is actually FGM tourism coming into Kenya Every year. Of June yeah. tourism. Yeah. Interesting term. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it's very sad, but there are families coming in with their girls. They have them cut. Uh, yeah, I totally know because I come from such a community where they do that sometimes. But now I want to understand from a perspective of there are actually women who are really advocating for this. For the women who are advocating for the FGM to happen, what are you doing? Or like, are you also training them any sort of activism when it comes to only yeah. those specific women? What are you doing in that case? I mean, this is the work of the frontline activists because if I come and tell those women you shouldn't do this, this is wrong. It will not be accepted. So you have to talk to people who are like you, and then it's much easier. You find the right words, you speak the language, you understand the culture. And then by uh, explaining, you can uh, help the women, the mothers or the fathers and the families understand that this may be not the best interest and only if that conviction is getting holding ground through education community education also religious leaders who who can uh, because many are afraid that they're violating a taboo 
Um, but also what has helped is that we helped create alternative rites of passage. Because we have seen that this is also a social element. It's an element for the community to rejoice, sing, dance, have fun. The girls want some, many girls want it because the others do it and they want to be part of it. And they are also being told they are not clean or good girls if they are not being cut. So, um, the school teachers, school education, sensitization, all of this plays a role. And um, what is very important is that the EU is not seen as trying to impose something. We are helping those who want to make the difference in the country. And after all, it's a law. It's the, it's the will, the national will of the country enshrined in a law. But um, the killing of the police person is showing that this is not universally um, accepted by the society yet. That's why it's so important to work with the activists. Because I am absolutely 100% convinced that nobody wants to harm anybody else. And nobody wants to harm the girls. They do it out of conviction that they do something good. And uh, the other thing we do is, um, of course, working with the cutters. In many countries in the world where FGM is prevalent, we had very good results working with the cutters in terms of giving them alternative livelihoods. Right. Very interesting. My final question then would be, you know, what would you like to see as the EU impact in Kenya? Even if your term ends, what would you like to see? What I would like to see is that Kenya is in a better space. And I think you're moving very fast into better spaces as a nation. Um, but I would like to see that the EU made a small contribution to it by empowering at certain critical moments, both in the government space, uh, helping on critical reforms, for example, on a justice sector reform. This is our largest investment in whole sub-Saharan Africa on justice. We had great, great results on access of vulnerable groups to justice. The digitization we have helped to digitize all the land registries um, in all the land registry in Kenya. So that helps to give certainty to land titles. We empower women and youth to go into agro-business, but agro-business that makes actually money. We, um, we see that Kenya has this incredible ambition to go 100% renewable. So we are helping in that space. So if I can see that when I leave this country, we are at 100% renewables, or the FGM rates have gone below 10, there are many indicators that will uh, show me that we have contributed to something that is happening. So. That would be my great ambition. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your time. On that note, we wrap up this week's World Report. Remember, if you have any comments or queries, you can reach me on my social media handle at Noor Fatir. Thank you for watching.